Greetings, and uh, my name's Frank Hinton. Uh, you're about to experience another episode of Aceta's Archive of Excellence, uh, which is um, all about uh, an initiative aimed at um, inspiring, uh, educating, uh, but mainly honouring people who have really achieved uh, highly. And, uh, and also preserving our heritage, you know, and maybe for the, the whole community to have access, to have a bit of an idea on, a, on, on what they, many would see as a bit of black magic, I guess. Um, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the remarkable career, and would you please welcome Murray Tregoni. I don't know, Frank, to, whether I should call you Parky or Graham Norton, but you're not gay enough for Graham, so we'll go with the Parky thing. This is where the theme comes in. Da 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 Can you work on that? Budget, that's cool. Right. It's Murray, cool. I was thinking the Adams Family theme, because it well, sort of feels like we're on the set of the yeah, Adams Family, doesn't it? <laughs> it does yeah. feel like well, We're actually here at the Rose Hotel in uh, lovely Chippendale. Yeah, it's um, a university hotel, just uh, for those that are not in Sydney. Uh, just opposite uh, Sydney Uni, so it's um, a well-known watering hole. I hope the noise in the background is not too bad, all right? Mm. You would think whoever picked the location would know better. So we're, we feel pretty cool, don't we? We, we do, mate, yes. So, let, let's begin. Are you ready? Absolutely. When were you born? Well, first of all, can I say something? Yeah. I, I, I feel quite honoured to be asked to do this. Um, and. When you start reflecting, uh, I started writing notes for you, mm. a background, I got to 15 pages and when I sent it to you and then I, there are other things that I remembered and it's not till you start thinking back um, and writing it down that you realise, oh, I have done a fair few things, <laughs> different things, yeah. yeah. Question, when was I born? Yeah. Uh, 1953, July 53. In, so Ge I, in Geelong? In Geelong, so I'm 66, not out so far. Right. Okay. And so you actually, uh, rumour has it, you were a musician for a while. You were I, a bass player as a 14-year-old? I, I, I was as a 14-year-old. Yeah. I was in a, a band um, yeah. in Geelong and we played at uh, several venues. We did a couple of gigs in Melbourne, which was big to go from you know uh, Geelong to Melbourne. But that was like uh, uh, late 60s. So I was still at school. And yeah, I was a bass player and we played... Um, uh, support for Masters Apprentices and the Twilights and you know, that, those kind of bands. So it was a really big time for music, as you'd well remember, uh, yeah. anybody else that's that old, you know. Um, so it gave me an interest in sound, you know. I, I started to think, yeah, now how do they get it from that to the record, yeah. right, yeah. that I've got in my bedroom? How does that happen, you know? So I started looking at, you know, research of, you know, different mic line level preamps, all that stuff. I don't consider myself a techo, but I understand the basics of it and, and how it goes together. Um, and I think that's important. Uh, audio is, in, in television, audio is quite a, a unique uh, kind of department, let's say, because it's halfway between production and halfway between engineering. So you're up the middle there. and it's important what you do. I mean, sound is what carries the, in, on a film or a, a, a drama production, it carries the emotion. The mm. soundtrack's there, you know. Yeah. Um, a great friend of mine, Gary Wilkins, said, you know, it's so important to do a good soundtrack because you don't see many people coming out of a theatre whistling a two-shot, you know. I mean, it's, it's the sound that makes yeah. and complements the pictures. And, in television, that's terribly important as well, as well as film. So therefore, with that interest, uh, where did you take it? Did you start applying for jobs? I started applying for jobs and got yeah. knocked back while I was still at school. I was, you yeah. know, kind of thinking, well, ABC, uh, you know, Channel 9, Channel 7. Uh, there's no Channel 10 back then. Um, uh, sorry, there was Channel 10. It started in 64 or Channel O. Um, but I really wanted to go to, to 9 or, or the ABC. Um, being born in 53, of course, television didn't start in Australia, Melbourne and Sydney mainly, until 1956 with the opening of the uh, Olympics. And little did I know, 14 years later, I'd be working with those guys, those pioneers that actually did open Channel 7 and then later on the, the people that opened Channel 9. It's um, it, quite remarkable. So 
I, I take it that you uh, got a job at Channel 7? It was an ad in the paper, believe it or not, yeah. in the uh, Sun News Pictorial, as it was yeah. then, and uh, they were looking for trainees. And I applied for it, I went for the interview, and I got the job. And I was just shy of 17, and it was a great opportunity, so I thought, yep. Yeah. And I found out later I was one picked out of 70 applicants. Um, so that was June 1970, which 1970, doesn't right. seem all that long ago, but <laughs> <laughs> next year it's 50 years. Wow, okay. And then not long after, you moved on, didn't you? I did. Um, uh, look, Channel 7, like going from, you can imagine going from high school to television, it was amazing. You know, my mother said, look, you be very careful, there are loose women. Really? Yeah. There are homosexuals, there's alcohol, there's drugs. And that was only the first week, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, pardon me. So I started doing, well, working on the floor. Um, we also, in those days, had to do shifts in telecine, which is where the film is shown on projectors and things. So you get to know a lot of skills and how it goes together. I mean, you know, that was 16 mil film and videotape had come out in the late 60s. So, but a videotape machine, <coughs> pardon me, in these days, in, in those days were, you know, the size of this room. Yeah. Uh, all valves, of course, and quad, two inch, you know, tapes. Um, but it was a great learning curve. And it, as I said, I was, working with guys that had done the Olympic Games. I mean, Channel 7 Melbourne did the Olympic Games with three cameras. Uh, they only had three cameras. The Olympic Games. <coughs> three cameras at the main stadium. They had two the more, stadium, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. only two more. They only had five cameras in total. Right. Okay. And that was between the OB van yeah. and, and the studio. Right. So <coughs> to do the 6.30 news, they had to take camera chains back and oh, gear. Right. So the crew were sleeping on camp stretches in the studio between shifts, they didn't have time to go home. So right. um, it was a pretty full on time, but look, and as I said, to start working with them 14 years later, and I mean, I'd been watching as a kid, I think I can remember uh, probably 1958, um, the people next door got a television. We used to go in there. And I think I remember, <coughs> pardon me, the Queen's visit to Flemington, I think it was. And I think it must have been about 59 that we got a television. And of course, I have two older sisters. One's seven years older, one's three and a half years older. Good family planning. Yeah. Um, and of course, we were avid television watchers. You know, I mean, the, the amount of television we were watching in those days was phenomenal. So <clears throat> little did I know I'd be you know, working with some of those people from those live programs that I was watching on Channel 7, you know, uh, as a kid. Um, so uh, I started, as I said, as an assistant, and I was doing Boom, uh, Boom Microphone in the studio. I worked on Homicide, the Mike Walsh Show. <clears throat> Every day was different. We worked six day weeks because, uh, and during the football season, because Channel 7 still had, well, had the football originally then. Um, pardon me. Yeah. So, you know, the week would be, um, I did boxing. TV Ringside at Festival Hall, Monday nights. With Ron Casey? Yes, and oh. Merv Williams, we yeah, yeah. So I started off as an assistant and ended up mixing that in the truck. Right. Uh, <coughs> smelly old place. And um, Tuesday, can't remember, Wednesday was homicide and we'd start at like seven o'clock in the morning and we'd finish at allegedly seven o'clock, but it'd be like 10 o'clock at night. Then back Thursday, we'd do the Mike Walsh show at the Telly Theatre, which was a remote st uh, studio out at Fitzroy. <coughs> Friday would be uh, football inquest type, you know, pre-football. Saturday would be the football. Sunday would be World of Sport. Right. So then not long after, therefore, you went to Channel 9. Well, what I started doing, I, I did more and more, and then I was kicked upstairs to become an audio operator and ended up being the main audio operator of the six o'clock news and current mm. affair programs, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And I started training. I was still a junior. I was 19. Right. And being paid as a junior, under okay. 21. So um, just to give you an idea, I started uh, on, in 1970, $26 a week. Right. Right. Uh, before tax. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. 
Yeah, well, so yeah, it's uh, but twenty six dollars went a long Nothing's way. Nothing's changed in our industry. No, 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 not at all. But as they say, Frank, you know, you pay peanuts, you get money. So <laughs> yeah. here we are. Um, but don't we love our industry? We do. I mean, uh, I, I don't think it's an occupation. I think it's more a way of life. Yeah. And I think it's terribly important. Uh, and I've tried. I was mentored um, by some great people, and I've tried to mentor people and pass on my knowledge. You know, play it forward. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. So. At 19, I was you know, main operator, da da da, and I was you know, doing things and miking bands and doing all that stuff. And I was then training adults you know, that had come in that were you know, 22, 23, and they're being okay. paid adult money, and I'm a trainee, right? And I'm right. training them. Okay. So I got a phone call from a guy called Colin Stevenson. And it was via Gary Jones, who was a TV director, it was at seven and went to nine. And uh, he rang me and said, um, Colin wants to talk to you, give him a ring. And we both called each other about the same time. So I went over and had a look at Nine and I thought, my God, this is, you know. I mean, I love Channel 7. It was fantastic and a fantastic training ground. But Channel 9 was like going to Hollywood. It was just what they were doing in Richmond was just amazing. I mean. It's sad to think all that's gone, that facility, which was just so brilliant, you know? Mm. And three studios are working full time, you know, all yeah. the time. And they were doing variety. And Colin was doing variety, you know, five nights a week. Um, yeah. I got there just at the end, IMT had finished and Graham Kennedy was still on the air before he did the crow call. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the broadcast control board um, took him off or he had to be recorded. Um, but Colin was a great mentor. Um, and I owe so much to Colin. I wouldn't, wouldn't have done Hey Hey and half the other things that I've done without mentors like Colin. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the one at Channel 7 that I must uh, pay uh, my dues to is uh, Bruce Adderley, which I hope that you get one time too. Um, Bruce still is active, running a sound recording studio outside of Shepparton, would you believe? Yeah. At the age of near on 80, I would think. Wow. So. <coughs> Those guys, um, and, and Colin's department was great. You know, there was Ken Wycross, who was his 2IC, and, and Peter Evans. I worked closely with Peter Evans, and uh, Peter Evans was in lighting before he got into sound. And Peter was involved with John Fowler and uh, Mr. McKissick here yeah. in Sunbury, and, and lighting Sunbury. Um, and Peter's just written a book um, of the four years of the Sundry Festival. And I didn't know it had gone on for four years. I was there at the second one, working for Channel 7 in my Channel 7 overalls. Um, but those kind of guys, I mean, later on it was uh, Mike Smith um, and uh, Andy Gersh, but it was a real good team. Chris Doyle was another one. And we worked, you know. Uh, uh, you can't make television by yourself. It, it's a team effort. and you've got to be a good team to do it. And the better you are, the tighter you are, the better product you can make. So I was very fortunate to do that. Um, so when I got to Channel 9, would you like to continue? Would you like another, uh, ask me another question? No, no. Um, Is an hour gone yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, carry on. So. You're at Channel 9 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was hired to do presentation and presentation as what I was doing at seven as well. In those days, you'd have a coordination director, and a director's assistant that kept times and things, and an audio guy. So you would be mixing film, videotape, all the programs going to air, right. uh, promotions. Yep. You would do news breaks, you would do everything, but, you know, and you would work an eight hour shift. So Colin said, would you do, you know, da da da. Now, mind you, I was offered th three times the money I was making at Channel 7. To go to nine. <laughs> to go yep. to nine. So instantly, yeah. I was making, you know, like $250 a week, because I can't remember what it was, but it was a lot more than $26, or it might have been $30 by then. Right. So uh, 6.30 till 3.30, basically Monday to Friday. Uh, but on Saturday, uh, live hostings. And we did live hostings as well, um, and there were live commercials during the week. Uh, it was a program called Hey Hey It's Saturday, which had started in 72, and I'd got there in 73, uh, May 73, I started at GDV. I remember 
just digress for a second. I remember doing the 6.30 news at Channel 7 on the Monday night, going out and getting a skin full, and then driving to work the next morning, and I went to South Melbourne instead of Richmond, but I still got to Channel 9 on time. <laughs> we really went to the wrong TV station. So, um, Hey Hey was basically live hostings of cartoons, right? So there would be a golden bowl segment, which was people would come in from, you know, do athletic Any personalities and, at this stage? Employed? Yeah, Daryl was doing it. Yeah. And he originally started in 72 with um, uh, McKenna, the footballer. Peter. Peter McKenna. Yeah. Leading goal, co goal kicker for Collingwood. Um, Wonderful player. Collingwood supporter, you can tell, can't you? <laughs> so in Studio One, where it was done, yeah. The wrestling, do you remember the wrestling world oh, championship wrestling? Yes, 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 used to do it on Sunday as well. Yes. It was the same crowd that did uh, TV ringside boxing on the Monday, would do the wrestling on Sunday. They would all come for a festival hall. Same yeah. people, right? Right, okay. Yeah. Um, same audience. <coughs> Pardon me. And the, the Jack Little, you know, I mean, yeah. what a voice. And what a presenter, you know. Yeah. But it, it was fun to work on. Anyway, the wrestling ring was in the studio. So during a live segment, Daryl has said to Peter McKenna, let's have a wrestle in the thing. So he gets in the wrestling ring, both of them are wrestling, right? Yeah. That's fine. Show goes off air, it was 8 to 11 and, and originally in the morning and uh, Peter then went to Collingwood to play football. Peter didn't kick a goal <laughs> because he was so buggered from wrestling. <laughs> so oh, that was oh. the end of, end of Peter McKenna's TV career. So okay. the producer of it uh, was Ernie Carroll. Ernie Carroll uh, well, started in radio and TV. Ernie, I have a photo somewhere of Ernie Carroll in a white dust coat running cables in Richmond before they went on air. And Ernie, another great mentor, um, comedy writer for Kennedy, uh, but was also, he had done a children's show as Uncle Ernie and he had this puppet made called Ozzy Ostrich. So, who, a funny little Austri uh, Austrian puppet maker made it, you know. Um, so it was this, you know, this was the neck and the head, yeah. and he would just sit out outside the frame. Yeah. Wasn't protected from anything, just sat there. The cameraman could not pan left, or sorry, right. <coughs> Otherwise they'd shoot Ernie. And, um, I think I said when I wrote notes to you, um, Ernie is a Gemini and he's so very quiet personality, but through that bird he is just, yeah. you know, an extrovert. And I would go down to the floor and I'd be talking to the ostrich, you know, and he'd be answering me. You know, I wouldn't be talking to Ernie, I'd be talking to, to Ozzy. We all did. It, it, it was just, he was just so lifelike yeah. how he did it. Yeah. And, um, the amazing thing, talking about Geminis and, and puppeteers, um, I was fortunate to sit in on a Muppet show in the late 70s uh, in London um, at ATV Studios at Bourne Wood, and I met Frank Oz and I met Jim Henson. Jim Henson, Kermit the Frog, also a Gemini. He could have been Ernie Carroll's brother. They were so much alike, the personality, really reserved, but through extroverted, through that bird. So, when Peter McKenna uh, had kind of got, got sacked. Well, he was told he wasn't going to Channel 9 anymore. Ernie thought, oh, he was the producer of Daryl. And he said, well, he actually auditioned Daryl and hired him, would you believe, for cartoon hostings uh, called Cartoon Corner, Monday to Friday, uh, four o'clock or something after school, uh, which was done live. And um, Ernie brought out Aussie, and that was the start. And Blackman and I, John Blackman, uh, joined the same time in those days the booth announcer would be, you know, next on nine, you know, or yeah. they'd be doing, you know, uh, commercial tags for, for commercials, you know, available at Walton's, McEwen's, and all that. Most of the announcers, because 3AK was in the same building as Channel 9, would be, they'd come up and they'd record all, you'd record all the carts for them. So onto audio carts, take. Um, I need to stop you there, because I actually want to jump in there, because that's one of my questions. <laughs> yeah. You are, very much synonymous, obviously, with sound effects and also wireless. So we won't, yeah. get, we won't get to the wireless thing yet, but I bet you the thousands who end up watching this uh, 
would have all been brought up in a digital age with a keyboard and, and, and with sound effects and all of that sort of stuff. But we, we, we'd have to ask you, how did you, you were obviously using cart machines. Yes. So, so what was the whole process? Because you become a famous personality on that show as well for your sound effects. Well, it just happened. It was right. It, 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 it wasn't planned. None no. of this was planned. No. So, I was there doing doing sound and you know mixing their microphones and you know the cartoons and all that stuff. Blackman, uh, who was supposed to record, but he would stay live just in case. So yeah. he was waiting. He started throwing voices in. I then started throwing uh, sound effects in, and we were working at a studio. Ad libbing. Ad libbing. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. well, you know, just like. Started to throw sound effects in. And I didn't meet Daryl and Ernie until about three weeks in. And they said, that's fantastic. Just keep doing it. You know, I said, oh, really? And they went, yeah, yeah. So in Studio One, I think we had two cart machines. Um, and I started gathering carts. Now, Colin was doing IMT or had done IMT. And there were a lot of cart sound effects that had been done for Kennedy sketches. Right. So, you know, bow and arrows and all that stuff, as well as stuff on library, as well as stuff that had been recorded. So yeah. I started helping myself to all these right. cartridges, right? Yeah. Because we had no budget. No. And for those that don't know, an audio cartridge is a tape loop um, on quarter inch lubed tape. Um, you bought them in um, predetermined lengths, like 20 seconds. 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds. You get up to, I think it was five minutes, was the biggest one. When you recorded them, um, it put a stop pulse. So there was a Q track, they were originally mono, and then we, we converted to stereo. They were all made by Consolidated Industries in Melbourne, these machines, and they were sold worldwide. I mean, every radio and TV station had Q Master car mm. machines, right? So, like if you're recording a shotgun, you'd go doof, record, stop. Doof, record, stop. So you'd have five on a 20 second loop, right? So you'd go bang, bang, but you had to wait for it to cue. And of course you, you didn't pull them out if they weren't cued because when you go to play them, again, they wouldn't do. So you had to remember that. So in the end, I had 2,000 cartridges and eight machines. Right. Right? So <laughs> I could find anything in <coughs> five seconds and put it on air. Really? I was that quick sometimes I'd wow them in, so the machine was <laughs> getting up to speed, yeah. Right. So how did I do it? It was like a game of concentration. You remember concentration yeah. the TV yeah. show? Well, there's many uh, versions of that kind of TV show. So I would have animals, I'd have human noises, I'd have uh, motor cars, I'd have aeroplanes. So that was my order. Uh, music tracks, but I knew, so you always put them back. So I then designed cases that would take, I think it was 120 a side, about 240 cards in cases. So I had eight road boxes, which I actually sent to Hollywood, to Warners where we did two shows at Hollywood, which was really funny sitting in an OB truck outside. And I was with Colin, Colin Stevenson. So Colin had left nine at that stage, mm. wasn't my boss anymore. And we had to do these shows, and of course they couldn't. Um, they couldn't uh, let Mike Smith go, who was mixing the show uh, in Melbourne, because he had other things to do, Sale of the Century and everything else. And we were going to be away for two weeks. It was in November, I think, um, '91, I think it was. Colin left in '85, so I rang Colin and said, "You want to come to America?" <laughs> he said, "Yeah." <coughs> Pardon me, <coughs> and we took Darren Moore as well, so they, we were the three audio crew out right of Melbourne. But I had to air freight all these carts. It was so funny. Right. So, but so explaining to the Americans was probably the funniest part in the two months leading up to going. Right. We had to explain to them that it was an ad lib, so there was no script. I mean, the two hour or three hour show was a fool's cap page, double sided full cap page. So when in doubt, the great thing about commercial television is if the shit hits the fan, you go to a commercial break, right? And we very, very often, and live to air, I mean, there's no safety net, right? But So the just, shit did hit the fan a few times, didn't Oh, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. And Blackman and I, our biggest achievement was to break up Daryl, make him laugh, on, uh, break him up. Right. And I would play um, various tracks to, later when we had an audience as well, but. I'd come out and he'd know what it was. It'd be something dirty. I mean, I had things about, you know, vibrator songs and I had 
uh, one of the famous yeah. ones was um, uh, Monty Python. Thank you. Um, had a memory loss there for a moment. Monty Python did a track, Sit on My Face and Tell Me That You Love yeah, Me. Yeah, know it well. And it, it was a rewrite of a Gracie Field, if anybody's that old, song, right? Relax. And it happened to be in the same key, right? So I'd got the library, because I used to just go to the library, <laughs> record library at 3 8, yeah. 3.8K, because they had everything. Even though they were a beautiful music station, they had everything. So you go down and you get Annie, get your gun, whatever. So I found Gracie Field. And, and it was, um, sing as we go and let the world da, da, da. But the intro was the same. Da, 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 da. So I cut and edited yeah. the Monty Python you know, entre, uh, intro onto Gracie Field's vocals. Jeez. So always I used to play it coming out of a commercial break or something, and I'd fade it out quickly before Monty Python started singing. So I said to Blackman, watch this. So I play it coming out of the commercial break and Summers has gone, oh yeah, and welcome back. And then he hears the vocal. Well, of course, he instantly goes white and stops and just looks at the control room. And then he, re and the whole crew broke up, of course. Yeah. And then he realized it was Gracie Field singing, you know, sing as we go. And let, let. So those were the kind of funny things we used to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So look, to be paid to do something like that <laughs> yeah. uh, and make it up, yeah. just make it up, just do it, you know? Yeah. And, but we had, I don't know, there was a, this thing between Daryl, Ernie, Blackman, and so we didn't have to talk about anything. Mm. We'd just be on each other's wavelength. Yeah. And I, I could throw a sound effect in, in the middle of something, and they would change the direction of where they were going, because they needed something to feed off. You know? Right. So and the script what, was one bit of fool's cap paper. There wasn't a script. There was, there was a rundown. A rundown. Run <laughs> run yeah. So the show was two hours? Originally three, and then two, yeah. yeah. So it, it, uh, it played uh, daytime, uh, we, well, 73. We didn't do it in 76 because Daryl went and hosted a revival of Bandstand, which didn't work, but it was done out of Sydney on a Saturday, so we didn't do it. And that was one reason that I moved on from Channel 9 right. uh, and went freelance. But um, then we were back uh, in 77, uh, 77, 78, and we went to, I think it was 84, it went to night time, and I went, oh, that'll be the end of that. 84 went to night time. Right? <coughs> and it went to uh, two Prime hours time at 9.30. Well, yeah. On 9.30. Originally, yeah. and then it came back to 6.30, and it was up against uh, Young Talent Time. And unfortunately, uh, we killed Young Talent Time in the ratings and actually killed the show, but, which was a bit sad because, mm. you know, Young Talent Time was really kind of an important show. Mm. Um, but... Uh, I left in the end of, Ernie left in 94, because he, he went, I'm getting too old for this. Well, uh, I went to his 90th birthday this May, just gone. So uh, Ernie went, I forget to move the beak, you know. And yeah. I went, oh, that's bad, you know. So I stayed on till, he left in 94, I left in 95. Um, the show went on till 99, I think, and then finished, then came back for a couple of, um, revival shows, which was interesting by this stage because they would ring me and say, because Daryl have this, have you got the palm olive gold commercial or something? And be, oh, so I said, like, yes, I'll email it to you because I had them all on hard drive by this stage. Um, so I transferred all the tapes to, to hard drive, but they quite often ring and I just email them, you know, for that night's show, they wanted something for whatever. But um, mm. So uh, was that, when you were at nine uh, and through that period with Hey A at Saturday, was that your main uh, priority or were you doing um, other things at nine or was it main, you know, mainly... Oh, okay, so when I left nine, I left nine in uh, full-time as a full-time employee, so I was there for three years. Right. Uh, in 76, I went to a place called Media Sound. Yeah. Media Sound is now Sing Sing Studios. I think it's still in Chapel Street. Yep. Um, Media Sound had been built as a purpose-built sound studio before Armstrong's, before um, uh, Roger had come to town. Um, and it had a floating floor uh, on the first floor because of the trams in Chapel Street. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it was a great size studio. You could fit an orchestra in there. Yeah. You know? um, and they were originally called Broadcast Sound of Australia. No, broadcast... 
Broadcast Media. No, Broadcast will come to me. Broadcast Exchange of Australia. Because originally they would send out 78 discs, hmm. right, of radio series, radio serials. Right. And they were dealing in, they also then recorded a lot of them in the, in the 70s. Um, and I love 78s because a lot of the early sound effects records were yeah. on 78s. Right. I mean, when I started at Channel yeah. 7 and, and then at Channel 9, they would be sound effects like harbour effects or traffic effects or whatever. And in news, in those days, they'd shoot 16 mil film silent. And then there'd be a live voiceover, live to air, <laughs> and you'd be playing 78 records behind the voiceover, you know. So if there was, you know, whatever, you'd preview the film quickly before it went to air, uh, and then you'd be playing, you know, live, live sound effects of background stuff, uh, you know, nothing like spot effects, but you, know, you could put a few gunshots in there, of course, which we used to do uh, during movies as well, you know. Right, so I guess we've got to the period, therefore, so... We know about this sound effects thing, um, but you're also renowned for, you know, the early introduction or development with a few others of uh, wireless microphone Wireless techniques. microphone, yeah. yeah. Um, it really uh, intrigued me uh, because, so I was at, let me just f finish the broadcast sound thing. Uh, it was uh, broad uh, bro uh, media sound. Media broadcast, sound, yes, yeah. right. They were still recording ABC radio dramas during the week. And okay. Was this Monty Mosel's? Yes, Monty Mosel's. Oh, right, another okay. mentor. Yeah. Monty Mosel's, I, yeah. I think I told you, is now an actor. Yeah. And uh, he was the neighbour in... Um, uh, castle. The castle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> You've got to feel the vibe, right, Frank? Feel the vibe. <laughs> so I was yeah. intrigued by these people doing actors doing radio serials. You know, like, wow. We're in 1977 and they're doing radio, right? Fantastic, right? Um, but the best thing was they had live sound effects. Right. Now, radio uses a lot of things like film does with Foley, you know, so footsteps on cement floors, yeah. wooden floors, car doors, you know, on, on props, you know, every kind of conceivable lock on a, a wooden door slam and all that stuff. I actually was given these and I somehow a long moving from one place to the other, I lost them. But I had a, a door, full door with all the locks, and a car door, which was like an Austin A7 car door. It was like a, you know. But they did all those sound effects live, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. So I digress. So when, then I went freelance uh, after Media Sound. I didn't really like doing radio commercials. Mm. Um, I didn't mind doing the music demos, but radio commercials, mm, yeah, yeah, I thought, no, nah, there's, there's more of a life here. Yeah. So I thought, I'll go and be a freelance sound recordist. What do I know? Nothing, but I'll go out. So I went out as a boom swinger, um, doing commercials. Didn't do any drama, I don't think, um, but I did commercials. And that was about, I don't know, 12 months or something. And then I bought my first microphone. Sennheiser 816, which I still have, and I still have the original invoice under glass from R.H. Cunningham's in R. H. West Cunningham's, Melbourne. Yeah. That was before Mr. Sloss was the yeah. Sennheiser dealer. Um, and I bought a Nagra. I used to uh, rent Nagras and things, but um, and, and Nagras are just fabulous machines, the preamps in them and everything else. I mean, so I was doing film sound stuff and I then, you know, was introduced to radio mics. Now, I remember back to Colin Stevenson. Colin had a Sennheiser. It was the first radio mic I'd ever seen. Uh, and this was something from the late 60s, but the transmitter was the size of a paperback book. Yeah. It was 30 megs. The aerial was about 10 feet long, so you'd have to run it down one leg and up the other leg, and it worked about 10 feet. So it wasn't, it wasn't a great, fantastic device, right, technical right, device. Right. Anyway, in film, they started using radio mics. Uh, and, and Gary Wilkins, a good friend of mine that recorded um, Break and Morant and lots of other movies. Um, but he, before radio mics, like in the court scene in Break and Morant, he had to have a microphone, you know, behind the flowers. It was all that kind of stuff. Because you couldn't mic it. You couldn't get a boom over the top and there were no radio mics. Um, and 
Micron were probably an English company with the first, they were 200 meg radio mics. They were built really well, like a Mark IX Centurion tank, uh, in a metal case, little receiver, battery pack, and there were about four frequencies. But they were really good. They weren't diversity, but they worked well. And I mean, in film, you didn't really need diversity because if there was a crackle of fart, you'd reshoot it, right? But yeah. I've got to say they were really yeah. fantastic. I mean, I, I had people fall out of trucks <laughs> with radio mics on and everything else, you know, accidentally, of course. Yeah. But they stood up to, you know, yeah. um, the, the action. So it fascinated me. So I remember with Peter Evans, we did a, a thing for SBS. Um, and uh, at Fairfield, there was an open air, Melbourne Fairfield, uh, an open air auditorium. And we did this Greek tragedy with about six microns. And we, we had Latin batteries to power them and a multi-track on location to record it all. But it all worked, but it was you know m amazing in, in the time. And I'd get calls from um, John Scandrid was another one. John Scandrid ran a company called um, System, System Sound. Yeah. And John was very big in the theatrical world. Yeah. Uh, everything, you know, playing our song, da 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 da. And I remember he would ring me and say, do you have, because those days radio mics were on one set frequency and one set frequency only, right? Yeah. So we, I think for playing, you needed an extra one and, and uh, there was a strange one, like there was 202.6 and 202.9 worked and whatever. They're all there. They're all like in uh, Channel 8, uh, Channel, Channel 8 band uh, between 9 and, 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 and 7. Um, but he was using them on stage and they were working fine. Still no diversity, of course, but um, I did quite a few things with him as, as it went on. Um, there was a call for radio mics. Colin had one, Stevenson again, uh, from Sony. Um, Sony had a 400 meg one, right? Now, 400 meg in Australia is not kosher, really, uh, but it is in, in Japan. And it was a handheld microphone with a transmitter built in the handle of the microphone. Fantastic. Mm. You know, for dance numbers or whatever, you know, not dragging the cable across the studio floor. Um, and Colin had this from Sony. Well, um, I said, mate, I think there's a, there's a market here, right? So I don't know if we got one or we got a second one, but I was carting it on hire to the ABC, Channel 7 <laughs> and everywhere else, right? So Colin spoke to Sony and um, we actually got some 900 meg radio mics. He got them for Channel 9 and um, there was like six in a rack and they were expensive. Like, they were the first diversity UHF radio mics and I'm saying they were 12 grand? Yeah? <laughs> Graham remembers. So we kept, like the market just kept going. Like, and I was sending them to Perfect Match in Sydney and I was, it was one of the reasons I probably opened an office in Sydney, but they, they were going everywhere, these microphones in briefcases, right? right. And the people couldn't get enough of them which was yeah. fantastic. So, What time frame was this? Oh, Colin, I think, showed it to me in 79, early 80s, Graham, I think, yeah? I think about 81, yeah. and it went through the technology. So 900 meg wasn't used in Australia. It was a, Canadian frequencies. And um, what killed it in the end was uh, analogue phones. I think 0010, uh, no, mm. 007, no, it was after that, it was 018. They took up the band. Right. Um, wow. Well, I don't know if they took up the band or the base station was above 900 meg and the phones were below, but the, the noise floor was just killed it. Yeah. So all these expensive radio mics, we got probably four years, five years, maybe six years out of them, you know, but technology marches on. But still only flexible between two frequencies. Yeah. It's a pocket transmitter like we're wearing and a handheld. Um, but they were, they were great. They were the mm. real start of professional radio mics. The electret condenser capsule wasn't that good. It could overload quite easily. Mm -hmm. But if you look back at some of the stuff uh, that Colin did, like uh, Sydney Opera House, The Queen, um, I remember Peter Allen at the opening of the Entertainment Centre. They're all sunny radio mics. Um, I remember uh, getting a call from, 
I don't know if it was Jans or somebody else, Mick Jagger was in Melbourne and uh, they had rung and I said, look, you know, Sony Radio Max. They said, oh, no, 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 the Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger, yeah. I'll give them to him, you know, not a problem. So they arrived on tour. <coughs> they didn't have any radio marks. So at the last minute I came, uh, I met the great man, I stood next to him while I did his sound check. I did the similar thing with um, uh, Neil Diamond, who amazed me with his microphone technique because he'd sing across the capsule, which I hadn't seen anybody do that. So he wouldn't mm. pop it, he'd sing across it, you know. Mm. But he didn't have a big voice, you know. I mean, I think Neil Diamond, had started off more as a songwriter uh, mm. than, a, than a singer, but you know, what a, what a great showman. I mean, Hot August Night, it's still one of my favourite albums. Colin, again, recorded that at, uh, with fame and uh, My Music Bowl, I think, yeah. which is still out there, I think, on the net. Um, YouTube, probably see it. Mm. Anyway. At this, I, pa at this particular point. Yes. Uh, you'd like to break? Right? No. Oh, okay. No, you, what, you're thirsty? Always thirsty. <laughs> No, I was just uh, wondering when um, Murray Tregoning and Associates, the company, oh, okay. entered the frame. Yeah. All right. So once I went freelance, I started my own business and called it Pamet Services, which was initials of my ex-wife and my, myself. It uh, went from 78. Yeah. Uh, 91, it morphed into Murray Tregoning and Associates. 91. 91. Got but it. I started, so I started radio mics, hiring radio mics, shotgun microphones. Prompting was another thing that, um, yeah. um, so being a sound recordist, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of jobs you do where it's a talking head to camera. And some of these have been shot in film, some on video. And I couldn't believe it that, you know, in that day and age, they hadn't thought of getting a prompter because the guy's looking eyeline straight at the camera, like, a prompter, uh, for those that don't know, um, well, AutoQ is a brand name, but there's many different brand names, um, is a half silvered mirror across the front of a monitor. Uh, so it's a flat screen monitor now, these days. It used to be a big tube monitor. Reverse scan, so the words are backwards. Hit the mirror. The lens sits behind the mirror, 45 degree angle. Half silver, you lose about half a stop through mm. uh, the thing. But the eye line's right. You've got characters, about 36 characters across. So the eye line doesn't dart as you're reading side to side. Um, so it looks like the person remembered. And yeah. we would be booked for half a day, you know, for our call to do, you know, a 10 minute spiel or something. And um, I remember when I first used it at AAV and I was with the sound recorders and doing prompting as well. Philip Adams was the presenter. And he came in because he was involved with the age at the time. Mm. And um, he had to do this piece to camera. And it was about six Bo minutes long. By the way, it's not vodka. I wish it was. It's gin. <laughs> um, Sorry, Mark. So that's okay. He, he, he's just gone, oh, train of thought. <coughs> so Philip sat down, did it in one take. 60, six minutes, spiel straight to camera. He was happy, mm -hmm. went into videotape to check it. The videotape operator said, God, he was good. How did he memorize all that? I said, he read it. He went, how did he read it? So I had to go and take the videotape operator in and show him how a prompter worked. He went, I've never seen that. I said, well, that's how newsreaders read the news. You know, they have a, a copy on the front, but it's, it's been around, well, it came out originally out of um, New York in the 60s, but they, in those days, before computers, it's much easier now, it would be, a full scap page, mm -hmm. and vision would be down one side, normal news script, and they'd get the top copy, and the rest were carbon copy, and this would be the spoken word, right? Yeah. And they'd have a Vidicon camera across this, and they'd have it on a conveyor. So this paper would go, so any change you had to do with tip X, or you had to cut stuff. And then the later ones became like a, a shopping, uh, a, a, like a, a, mm -hmm. a roll of, you know, an FPOS roll type thing, right? right? Yeah. That you'd type on. But in the old days, they used to have, before they had the split beam glass, they'd have prompters on top of the lens or below the lens or the old idiot sheets, which you know, you'd see, why, why isn't he not looking at me on television? Why is he looking off to the side? Because he's trying to read the idiot sheet. So anyway, mm. you know, I'm Don Lane. Uh, um, so um, prompting was great as well. Yeah. And, and so 
I was always looking at things, Frank, that I could bring in in technology that would make a difference to yeah. the industry. Um, and on that subject, mm. technology, what for you has been well, the most significant um, entry into the market or development in terms of technology that, you've, that you feel uh, has impacted you the most? Oh, I think uh, Sennheiser radio mics. Um, Sennheiser came out, uh, I'm thinking now, let's say early 90s. So after the Sonys and the Sennheiser. So Sennheiser were all of a sudden you could have 30, 32 radio mics. You'd have 16 selectable frequencies on each transmitter and each receiver. And you and can you, this is a new world, really. Oh, isn't it? Yeah, unbelievable yeah. new world. Yeah. And before that, just to give you some idea, Frank, is um, Peter Radcliffe, who was the sound designer, <laughs> at Jans would always ring me, Buzz, uh, yes, Peter, I need, you know, right, Pete, okay, madman, mm. lovely guy. And um, he said, uh, we're doing Jesus Christ Superstar in the round. I said, right, okay. He said, starring John Farnham, I went, oh, yeah, okay. He said, um, the sound designer from the New York, he's uh, Simon and Garfunkel's uh, sound guy, and he wants 32 radio mics. <laughs> I went, tell him he's dreaming. I mean, you've got to be kidding me, you know. 32 radio mics mm. in a show. Well, you wanted 33 as a spare. <laughs> You're right, okay. Let's see if we get 32. We'll be pushing. So, out with the slide rule. Another phone call to Mr. Stevenson. Colin, need to do this. We've got 16 Sonys I think we can use all at once. But we need 16 something else. So... Believe it or not, Jans, oh, sorry, Shaw had just released, um, hello Peter, Shaw had just released the L-Series uh, UHF radio mic, their first diversity radio mic. And I think from memory there was about mm, maybe 10 frequencies available. And Colin helped me and we got some special ones made that would fit. So in the end we had some VHF, 16 and we had 16 UHF and it worked. Right. So on the day of rehearsals and then they were rehearsing at the Tennis Centre in Melbourne, I met the sound designer from America and he came up and said, I believe you're my Richard Hunting. I said, well, it used to be. Um, and after sleepless nights, I said, 32 radio marks. Have you ever done it before? He said, it's never been done before as far as I know. I went, right. He said, how did you make it work? And I said, the show's called Jesus Christ Superstar. He's the son of God, and that's the only reason it's working, right? Yeah. <laughs> and there were a couple of fits and farts, you know, yeah. little dropouts. I noticed them. Wynn Milson was mixing, and he went, it's all right, don't worry. And, you know, it, 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 it worked. But mm. at two in Australia, at two in New Zealand, I remember I got a call from New Zealand saying, uh, and I think Chris Doyle was touring with it from memory, looking after the radio mics, and um, one of the actors dropped one of the transmitters in the toilet which was really handy. And I said, which particular one? He said, it was a 202.9. I said, shit, I actually have one here. Because <laughs> it had to have the same frequency. There was no frequency agility at all. Right. Right? Right. They're all hard crystal. So that, that was that show. Um, and then Peter Radcliffe, God bless his soul. How are we going for time, mate? That's what I'm just checking on. <coughs> right. Edit. Trying to be subtle. Edit. Oh, Edit. haven't got much. OK, I'll keep talking then. Um, I've got I a few talk more. under wet cement. I I, I know you've made my job very easy tonight. Oh, okay. But thank you. <laughs> That's okay. So Peter Radcliffe again then rings me and says, you know those 32 radio mics we've got in Jesus Christ Superstar? We're doing AIDA at the Sydney Football Stadium. I said, really, are we? Right. We need 32 radio mics. I said, what? At the same time? He went, yeah. He said, oh, he said, it should be easy for you. You've done all the hard work. I said, yeah, I've just got to find someone that's got that many. So swapping and changing it, yeah. did it again. So we yeah. duplicated it. Yeah. Then, one last radio story. Well, we then got to the Sennheiser, you know, um, and, well, and, and sure UHF then came out as well. Uh, but uh, Peter rings me and says, uh, Harry and Miller's doing um, Jesus Christ Superstar. This is going to be a theatre show. Okay. What do you know about in ear monitoring? I mean, right. Only what I've only what I've read, Pete, which is you know in English magazines. Um, yeah, Guy, you know, there's a few people using it. Peter Gabriel, da-da-da. Um, 
uh, I believe it's an English device, Garwin. He said, can you track them down? I said, sure, what do you want to do? And he said, I want you to buy some and hire them to me. And I went, oh, shit, do you? Okay, all right. How many are we talking? He said, oh, well, there's eight principles. And said, we better get 12 and the, they can share. So the trans stereo transmitter, one rack width, uh, two frequencies. Um, belt packs for the chorus, yeah, let's get six of those so they can all have the same feed in the mix. So we're talking about now 12 separate stereo mixes. So it's a, a monitor, a foldback, you know, whole new ball game. So you're off to the bank manager, right? I was. <laughs> right. The funny story I'll t tell you. So I could have been buying, because I'm importing them from overseas, mm. I found these guys, three engineers working in the second bedroom of one of their flats, I could have been buying a box of coat hangers, really. I mean, they could have sent me anything. You're you know? not talking about Chris Lindoff, eh? Yes, <laughs> Chris Lindoff, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, Chris Lindoff, mm. as you well know, yeah. developed ear models. I do, yeah. And didn't patent them. I, yeah, I knew that too, yeah. yeah. So that left, um, and I remember sitting down uh, with a shore engineer and in, asking him about ear models and Garwoods and all that stuff. Look. Garwoods were great. They were, um, the, the interesting story is that uh, they marketed them in America, a guy called Marty Garcia, who I had to track down as well, called Future Sonics. And he rebadged them as Future Sonics. So the Garwood radio station became Future right. Sonics. Yeah. And that's when bands started using them. I mean, the whole thing of ear monitors, and people said to me at the time, as they always do, it's never going to work. Well, it right. won't work. Yeah. How are you going to get all those frequencies? Yeah. That and radio mics, how's it going to work? But, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I, I, I remember showing them to John Farnham, right? And he's out in the recording studio and he's got the band all on ear monitors. And I said, come, and it, he's a fabulous singer. I mean, just standing beside him just puts the hairs on the back of your neck up. So, said, John, come, and, and we're in Warrandyte in Melbourne. We walk out, he said, oh, so he came out of the studio, we go up in the back paddock, of course, he can still hear the band, they can still hear him, he's gone, how long has this been around? I said, well, a couple of years. He said, why has it taken so long for me to have them? And I said, mate, you're a hard man to catch, you know. But the same thing happened, so just going back a, a little bit, um, Muddy Garcia made ear monitors and registered the name in America. Right. Made them for country singers originally, Yeah. which more rock and roll because it saves on vocal, sorry, it saves on vocal fatigue. I hate audio people that hit microphones. It hates, uh, uh, sorry, um, audio fatigue, but it's also all those fallback widgets, you know, yeah. and, and all the transportation costs and everything else, you know. I mean, huge savings. Mm. And the sound is, well, for, for a vocalist. Um, so I then, Peter said, what are your monitors? Of course you want your monitors, Peter. Okay. Harry's paying for it. Harry's paying for it, good. Right, okay, uh, so I speak to Marty Garcia, well, you need an audiologist, you need deep ear yeah, impressions. Uh, right, okay, uh, now I've got <laughs> all these actors spread across Australia and New Zealand. Mm. Nothing simple like they're all based in Sydney or they're all based in Melbourne. So then I had to find audiologists and had to explain to them because it's slightly different from what you do for hearing aids. It's, it's deeper into the, the ear than hearing yeah. aids. And they've got to fit properly so the sweat doesn't get down in the canal and you know, all that stuff. Um, and they've got to be comfortable. So um, he made them. I got all the moulds, sent them off to Pennsylvania. Marty made them, they all came back, put them on. So we're in Auckland doing sound techs with the guy that was playing Jesus, I can't remember now. Jesus, I can't remember. Um, and um, you see, vocal, uh, oh, he's got a, sorry, head, head microphone, he's got ear monitors in. And he said, and I'm standing beside him, he said, wow, doesn't that front of house sound fantastic? I said, there's no front of house on. He went, what? I said, that's all in your head. But I've got, I've got echo and things. I said, yeah, the fallback guy's doing, the wedge guy's doing that for you so it's not dry. So you hear, really? He had to pull them out. Okay, shit, you know, couldn't believe it. It was just so good. And the way that it just tightens up the sound on stage with, you know, microphone here, ear monitors and no foldback. It's, you know, sensational. Yeah. Now, we better push forward a little bit because oh. I've got one or two well, when's questions. When's episode two coming, Frank? What? 
part one, you want to do a part one and part no, two? Can, I think we should. Well, but there's going to be no editing, mate, because you haven't stopped. So, I mean, this is... You'll get the scissors in somewhere like a good <laughs> rabbi, mate. Don't you worry. I've <laughs> <laughs> got to ask a question. What? What? One? Yeah, yeah, I've got to ask you, because um, everybody will be interested, what's probably the most memorable, the most impactful uh, project you've uh, ever worked on? What stands, you know, sticks in your memory? Do you think it was that hey hey period? Oh, 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 certainly, certainly in television. But yeah. when I came, I, I came to Sydney because uh, the tyranny of distance. I had clients in Sydney, and you know, it, it, going backwards and forwards from North. I was never going to live here, so I opened, believe it or not, um, in Melbourne Cup Day, October '95. Yep. So around the corner here, two blocks away, we'd been there for 24 years. Right. And they said it had never worked, um, and they were right. Um, but. It was an exciting time to come to Sydney because it was leading up to the Olympics, why I wanted to come. It was the start of cable television mm. here and there were a lot more productions going on. Yep. Um, and there was a thing called Super League, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. That's a, a yet another story. Um, I think some of those, I mean, I like helping people and I like pushing the boundaries. I like mm. trying things, you know. Mm. Um, so, originally, uh, one of the radio stations did the Sydney fireworks, and I think they started in about 95 when I got here, right? Around 97, uh, Rick Birch took it over. Now, Rick Birch, I knew from Melbourne, mm. ex-ABC, he was at Channel 9 for a while with Don Lane Show. Um, he was also the producer of the Olympics. And Rick ran a company called Spectac, and mm. they wanted to, you know, uh, jazz up the fireworks, obviously. Yep. Because originally it started as a dry hire of a multi-track machine right. to a radio station. And they would put the soundtrack on and they would put fire code, uh, which is like time code, but slightly different, and vocal cords. So they would sit there and they'd have to work out when the explosion went off and how long it would take the canister to get up. Time to the music. So they had to work backwards. So they were doing vocal cord, all on a multi-track. So I started looking at it, and it, like the control room was at Grosvenor Place, which was a government building or government a level on, a, I think it's the 26th floor or something, down at the rocks. Just a panoramic view of from the heads of Sydney up the Parramatta River. <laughs> you know, the Harbour Ridge is there, Opera House is there, just fantastic. And they would have the police and the harbour police and da da da, all these people in there. And um, it would all be done with motor rollers, and they've got all these <laughs> show calls, got yeah. all these motor rollers. Christ, this is right, okay. So over the years, up until I think the last one I did was 2001, 2000. So we got proper clear com matrix um, panels, and we had. Uh, obviously um, connections to all the Motorola. So the show caller could have one microphone headset and talk on all these different channels, which was a great thing. Mm. And I said to them, now, how do you get that code to fire those fireworks up and down the bridge on a Motorola? And I went, oh my God, really? Well, it works. I said, <laughs> yeah, by the seat of, it, seat of your pants. I went, yeah, right, okay. They said, what would you do? And I said, oh, I'd put a telephone line in. They went, a what? I said, I'd put a telephone line in. So I was given the job to ring Telstra. And I said to the lady, uh, I'm working for the Sydney of City, City of Sydney, uh, working for Spectac Production and the Sydney Fireworks. Um, she said, yes. I said, look, we've got, and we would have in the control room, we'd have, you know, 20 telephone lines for the police and God knows what else, and program lines to UE and Channel 9 and, you know. So it was, it, it was turned into a big production of distribution of the soundtrack. And um, I said, I want to uh, install a telephone line. She said, yes, where to? I said, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. She said, right, where? And I said, you know the two flags on top? She said, yes. I said, under there. She went, right, who's paying for it? I said, the city of Sydney. <coughs> she said, right, okay. Got the telephone line, probably still there to this very day. But we could then send code and know on copper wire it wasn't going to 
die. So that was a great thing. Um, into Peter Radcliffe, he just keeps coming back in my life all the time. Muzz, um, we're doing, uh, and I think this was the Millennium ones, they had floating barges, tugboats and barges, yeah. Yeah, with long throw speakers, which they had to turn down as they went past the opera house, otherwise they'd take people's heads off, it yeah. was pretty loud. Yeah. And I think there were maybe 12 of these barges that were going up and down the harbour, all these lovely lights. and. It's all very Japanese, or, sorry, Chinese lantern type things. Peter said, I need to get sound to them. And I went, of course you do. How would you do it? And I went, okay, uh, a big FM transmitter. He said, really? I said, yep, <laughs> absolutely. Nice. So I had done special event stuff before with uh, ACMA. And um, so I said, right, okay. Uh, I need to get a license for this special events license. So I go back to Rick Birch's company and, and uh, anyway, I sorry, I rang Canberra, I rang ACMA and said, this is what I want to do. And they went, well, there are no frequencies available. I said, really? This is the city of Sydney. This is Millennium Fireworks, you know? And they went, it's also Ramadan. I said, right, Ramadan, good, okay. They've taken all the frequencies. Really? Okay, right. Uh, do they need them like at midnight? <laughs> they went, we don't know. We do. Okay. So I ring Rick Birch's assistant, um, Katrina Brown, lovely lady, can do lady. She said, who did you speak to? I said, uh, I think his name was Jules Tanner. I think he's the uh, director of you know, planning or something. He's still there. He, he nice man. <laughs> nice man. <laughs> Poor Jules. He must have gone, whoa. Um, yeah. So. No, I fine. then got, yeah, no, lovely, lovely guy, thank you. Lovely Ak guy. Thank you, Akbar. Um, um, so, <laughs> not only did I get a frequency, but I also, she said, what power do you want? I said, oh, <coughs> 200 watts. Yeah, let's make sure. And um, I think it was 200 watts, it might have been 100 watts. Anyway. Um, I think 200 watts, because it had an afterburner, it was a 20 watt thing and an afterburner, on, yeah, I think, yes. And a dirty great long stick about, oh, six and a half metres long, and on top of the building, which was, what did I say, 26 storeys high or something, so it was high. Um, so, she said, oh, da da da, whatever I asked for, I got double, you know, like, I might have asked for 100 watts, so I got 200 watts, and a frequency which was, believe it or not, 95.3, which is now smooth FM's frequency, but it was unallocated uh, uh, at the time. But it wasn't a standard special events frequency. So, fantastic, okay? Beautiful, get it up on the roof, da da da. Uh, Peter Radcliffe, receivers, generators on the tugboats, FM receivers, and he said, Muzz, I need to tune these things. I'm going to need a soundtrack. I said, yep. He said, uh, probably the same song over and over for about four hours. I said, not a problem. We'll probably have to do that over two nights. I said, fine, not a problem. Okay. In this stage... Hey, don't tell me sit on your face comes out. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I don't think it was sit on your face. It was something appropriate. But, right. Um, and it, it, I'd had hard drive... Uh, digi carts and stuff by this stage yeah. so it was it was a hard drive computer so you know repeat fantastic great get a phone call the next day from peter's gone holy shit mate that worked out the heads it worked up the Parramatta river i said well mate i'm not surprised i reckon it's probably going about 70 kilometers <laughs> the chief engineer of 2ue was amazed i said we well, can cancel your landlines mate just get an fm receiver and stick it on am radio it'll be fine right and um a funny German man. Uh, not no longer with us, I don't think so. We don't have to. Um, I digress. So I get a phone call from ACMA. Uh, we'd like to come and check your transmitter. Right, okay, sure. Right. So two boys from ACMA come and they said, Where is it? And I said, On the roof. I went, oh, Who made it? And I said, John Sandals in Melbourne made it. I said, I think it's in spec. And it happened um, that. David Ritter, who is a wonderful OB engineer from Channel 9, happened to be in the control room checking program lines with me. He said, can I come? I said, certainly. He was, he was looking for me. 
figure out, oh, you can be my bodyguard. So we go up, and of course they get all their measuring stuff up, and they check it. It's totally in spec, totally spot on, right? Oh, I said, was there a problem? Well, is there a problem? And they went, well, we got these phone calls from people in the Blue Mountains, right? Okay. There's a community radio station up there on the same frequency. <laughs> and I went, really? Okay. He said, and the fringe dwellers, this side of Sydney, were getting this same track for four hours, around and around. <laughs> they thought... They they thought the DJ had gone to sleep or, you know, he's on drugs or something. Right? And I said, oh, well, what are you going to do about this? They said, well, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, you've, you've got all the paperwork. The federal government have given it to you. As I come down with these guys, in walks Frank Sato. And I don't know if you know uh, Frank or who Frank was. Frank was the Lord Mayor of Sydney, right? <laughs> he took one look at these guys and he knew they were, you know, <laughs> the men, government men, I can tell they're G-men, right? He said, where are they from? I said, they're from uh, ACMA. Oh, what are they doing here? I said, they're checking our transmitter, Frank. Right? Why? I said, well, they, there were a few complaints. You know. He said, right, here's my business card. Have any trouble, Murray, ring me. There were a few more expletives in there, right? I'll take them on. I went, right, thanks, Frank, that's fine. So we did the show. It, it, it was wonderful. It, 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 it all worked. Um, and that was one achievement that, you know, um, that I yeah. like doing. I mean, it's something different uh, and something like that's pushing the the, the yeah. gauntlet a bit. Well, I tell you what, it is a legacy. And as we draw to a close, um, I think we can summarise. Uh, you've been an artist, been a musician for a while. A you've bullshit been... artist? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you've been an artisan. And a great artisan, you've pushed boundaries. I'll have to get me Funkin' Wangle out in a minute. Well, yeah, yeah. These words, these big yeah, I'm words just, I'm, using, ca I'm right? counting them up. Uh, okay. You've um, you've also been a mentor, seriously, and that's what this pro this program's all about. It's really about those who have mentored, uh, achieved, and also been generous, and that's you. Um, but also, as everybody's witnessed here tonight, you, 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 your your passion and love of the industry is clearly demonstrable. Would you thank Murray for me? Thanks,